I'm based in Switzerland, but so far I've never had the opportunity to come uh, come here to the Swiss Map Research Center, so uh, research station. So it's very nice to be here. Uh, yeah, so uh, I guess I picked a bit of a long title, but the the, the topic will be uh, to, to the previous talk, so, so the main on Conus Map Applications, but uh, We'll be revisiting topics that have appeared during the previous uh, previous days. So it's, it will be about uh, analytical solutions. So trying to understand, or in particular case, trying to study these quantum body systems that are in genius and to study them in a non-equilibrium situation. And what we will see is that a particular equation appears, the boogie with the gen equations, which is then what I try to solve. So first, before uh, Saying anything else, I could just introduce the, the equation that will then appear. It has appeared in many um, occasions, but uh, as far as I know, people didn't notice that, that it appears also in this particular situation. So, in the setting, there will be two, you will be given two functions, v and k, for uh, functions of position. So, in a sense, translation invariance will be broken because things will depend on where you are in the, the system. So, also imagine it's a one dimensional system or quasi one dimensional. So. Okay, so you have two functions, v and k, and the, the equation are of, of the form of you have some diagonal, oh, this doesn't work, um, so the diagonal elements, uh, basically like half of a wave equation, uh, the other half on the other, and then they act on some, um, some spinner or some, some vector with two components, and you have an off-diagonal um, uh, elements, which are given explicitly in terms of some, some, some combination of this function v and k. And it will be clear why, why this combination comes up. It, it's a particular result. Um, to point out, in, in the usual boogaloo of the gen equations, you would have Laplace operators, rather, so, so second order derivatives in, in space, and you would have uh, some kind of self consistency condition on, on uh, the off diagonal terms. So that, what corresponds to the gap in, in, in those cases. In here, there is no self consistent criterion. It, it is given by this external function. But one thing we can notice also is that if, if k is constant, right, there is this derivative here. So if k is constant, then this would be zero, and the off diagonal elements disappear. Um, so the question here for this equation would be so, so can you obtain a general solution when you have these um, uh, functions that depend on space? Uh, what is the effect of this uh, off diagonal term and, and what is the behavior as, as t goes to infinity? So, in a sense, this would be used to study, uh, say, for instance, a, a quantum quench. You start with some initial condition, you want to see how, how the system evolves uh, later on. Okay, so in terms of applications, as far as I know, the first instance of seeing this equation is, is from the work by uh, Andrea uh, in '64 when basically studying an interface between a normal metal and a superconductor. And that's usually the setup where these boogaloo of the gen equations appear as a, a description for uh, superconductors. Uh, and in that case, uh, he used uh, an approximation uh, where you could replace the, the second order derivative that you usually have by a first order derivative. And that um, allowed him to, to, to study this interface and uh, also then, then uh, well, introduce the, the, what is now called Andrea reflections. So that's the kind of the typical equation where Andrea reflections uh, appear. Uh, another application where this, this equation appears is in uh, the sue schrieffer heger model for uh, polyacetylene, I mean, if, you, if you write it in a continuum way. So that's another. What I'm focusing on today is for so-called tumanaga latting liquid. So, so latting liquid theory, uh, but to describe the dynamics of this, of this theory. And uh, so uh, the key thing here is that they would be inhomogeneous, corresponding to having a function v and a function k that depends on position. And this function v and k are usually interpreted as a propagation velocity, and k as the Lutting parameter, if you're familiar with, with those two, uh, or with the Lutting parameter. Um, so one can imagine 
uh, certain setups where, for instance, you have some, some, some spin chain, one d spin chain, but you, you, you let the lattice spacings between the sides vary with position, or you let the coupling, in, coupling between the sides vary with position, so you, you, you're breaking the translation invariance in the system, and in an effective um, mm -hmm. uh, description, you, you will obtain the, the, this, this uh, ingredients to monogatling liquid description. Uh, similar setup with cold atoms, if you put them in a trap, then translation invariance is also broken by the trap, and so on. Um, and this has been used, or I mean, we'll in particular use this for studying uh, quantum wires. So uh, quantum wire, see it as a one-dimensional system coupling two reservoirs. And one way to try to describe that is by letting the, the so-called Luttinger parameter, k, have two different values to the left and to the right, and some, something in between. And you see it as a toy model for, 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 a, quantum, uh, for a quantum wire. Another application that I studied in, in this paper was, you can imagine having um, a fractional quantum hall system, or two systems, then you have the edges, and um, you can find that it's a toy model for interactions between the edges. So if the interaction of a particular kind, it will again lead to this uh, the general equations, where, so the interaction here is lambda of x, and kind of on, on general grounds, the, the interaction will, the strength will decay uh, or vanish rapidly uh, when you increase the, this, the distance from them between the wires or be, between these edges. So, so in a sense, uh, that's why it's modeled here. So you have some, some translation relation is broken because the interaction is like a four fermion or four, uh, four anion interaction um, goes from some, some value to zero. So like the, trying to reproduce the setting up there. And uh, so I will not go into the details, but that's one of the applications I studied in, in, in that uh, particular paper. So uh, in concerning interviews from agalactic liquids, that has been studied before. Uh, it's been studied for quantum wires. Uh, I think the earlier paper is uh, Maslow, Stone, Safi Schultz, and Pomareko all came out in 95. Uh, and they also used PD methods, but they didn't observe uh, the particular form of the PD or try to solve it in, in full generality, which is what I will try to do. Uh, another application of it has been to study, as I said, um, also called atoms in a trap, uh, but it has been done in, in equilibrium. But the question here is now what non-equilibrium properties. And uh, that has also been considered, but uh, so, so, so there are a number of papers on that, uh, including by myself uh, and by by um, uh, various co-authors, going back, uh, I don't know, first, but uh, in a sense, what I claim here is I try to find the most general solution you can get for when you have this letting your parameter k depending on x, which we will see makes things more complicated. Okay, so that uh, brings to the outline. I will tell you a little bit, or review something about letting liquid theory, give some examples, uh, then explain why I would use the PD approach, and then show how you obtain the, the PDs from, from the tomonagalating theory, solve them, and if time allows, um, use one application. We'll talk about one application to, to kind of show that it, the formulas I have reproduces known results in the literature. Okay, so, so what about tomonagalating liquids? Um, perhaps some of you are more familiar with it in terms of viewing it as a compactified free bosonic theory. So they are, the same in that sense, and so so let me introduce it. I, I give a number of formulations, and perhaps one will ring a bell. So um, it's a usual case: propagation velocity v and the Lutting parameter k are constant now, and we will make them uh, position dependent later. Then you can write an action for a bosonic field phi, which is the usual uh, action for a compactified free boson, where compactification radius r is related to the a parameter in, in, in this way. So you can use R or you can use K, you, you can decide. Um, and this is field phi, I mean it's called compactified in a sense that, well it goes from, I have uh, my physical space uh, with system size uh, L with product boundary conditions and this field maps a point X to some point phi of X, but it's living on another circle with a different radius. In this case I wrote radius one, but 
if you multiply r with that phi and under r with that phi, then you see that that's a circle of radius r. And um, that's also why, why, why you call it complex radius r for this, um, for this field. Uh, OK. Um, what I would rather use is a Hamiltonian uh, framework. So in that case, you, you still have the same field phi, and you introduce the conjugate phi, as, as usual. And uh, you've written the Hamiltonian, uh, so I'm now just restating it in this way, and this is more or less the, the version I will be working with. Uh, so, so, so how can you try to understand this free quantified bosonic uh, model? So, so one way is that, okay, it makes sense to expand this in plane waves, so you will have an overall sum n, and then you have basically the same copy or same same model uh, with a label n. So this is basically a large number of uncoupled harmonic oscillators, but an infinitely many. So uh, that's, I mean, up to zero modes, which are, you have to handle them more complicated way. So in a sense, I have to see that there are, uh, that that's also what you can use to, to solve the model. So you use that the modes are uh, decoupled and uh, then you introduce uh, bosonic creation relation operators, one for each uh, species. So there will be right movers and there will be left movers in the system. So the right movers are these A's and the left movers are have bars. And then you find this kind of a usual U1 current algebra or a double copy of them. And the two copies commute. And you can define normal ordering, etc. So, so that's kind of. If you have that form, you also then know how to do computations because, well, it boils down to uh, using many copies of, of um, <coughs> three bosons. Uh, so if you find this form, your, your, everything is good. The question is then now we, we basically use that k was constant and what, what happens when k is uh, not constant? So that brings us to the next model then, when you generalize. So let v and k be uh, functions of position. Then uh, you can write down the Hamiltonian. Uh, you have this combination now v over uh, v of x over k of x and v x times k of x. If you like, that's just one way to write it. Uh, you could have called this capital A of x and capital B of x. Just two coefficients in front of these um, this, um, uh, two terms. Okay. Uh, so, uh, the general question of address is when both are periodic, uh, when both are inhomogeneous, but I just mentioned that when they are, when only V is uh, position dependent, then you can, you have an overall factor V of X, the rest is uh, as usual, and then you can handle this using conformal transformations. In a sense, you, you, you pick, uh, you make a change of coordinates such that you, you incorporate uh, V in that uh, new coordinates. And that's been studied. Uh, the first instance I worked on this was together with uh, Christoph Kavetsky and, and uh, Edwin Langman, who was my former PhD advisor uh, back in those, it's not too long ago, but both days. Um, and then it's something I've continued to study. Um, where, I mean, this uh, nice representation theoretic work, uh, toolkit that you can use uh, related to. Um, well, representations of, of, um, of um, yeah, circle diffeomorphisms. So that's basically what we're going to use. Uh, to try to reconnect now then to, to the action function I mentioned before, now and also highlight the difference between v and k. So the function v of x, you can put it into the metric. So that kind of tells you that this is, corresponds to curving space. However, the Lutting parameter k or R squared cannot be put into metric, so it's an overall factor that's always present, and well, that makes life more complicated. Uh, and so, in this case, you can see that's having an inhomogeneous compactification radius. Okay, and so we saw this in a previous uh, talk, so I just tried to reconnect with it. So, so, one way to interpret this is in the form of a marginal deformation by a, basically a JJ bar deformation. So, Imagine I'm changing from compactification uh, radius r of x to uh, r of x plus some, some, some small um, uh, change and uh, look at the difference in, this, um, in the action, then it's basically the same, uh, the same form as the Hamiltonian itself, 
which can be written in a JJ bar form. And uh, however, now this, this, this change uh, depends on position. So it's like an inhomogeneous JJ bar deformation. And it's marginal because, well, this J and J bar, the conformal weights are 1, 1. So, mm -hmm. so it's exactly the, the marginal case. The, the complication here is that, well, conformal invariance is, in a sense, not uh, conserved when you do this uh, deformation, which is the, the, the main point. So otherwise, if you're familiar with this um, JJ bar deformations, um, it would only correspond to uh, a change, a, a, re a renormalization of the compactification radius. But in this case, it's not as simple. Uh, I also mentioned this, this uh, action um, 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 functional in the sense that, well, it connects back to some previous works that, that I learned also actually was carried out at ETH. Um, so in this work by Bacchus and Brunner from 2008, they, they considered two um, compactifi compactified uh, bosonic theories, but with different compactification radius, and they connect them at one point. So half infinite systems connect at one point, and at that point they need to put in a so-called conformal interface, and then they study uh, this model. So in a sense, what I will do is generalize their work, but now I'm not just having one conformal interface, but in, in a, in at least in a formal sense, you have many conformal interfaces, or some smooth interpolation of conformal interfaces. Well, in, in the way I address it is done by solving uh, a PDE instead of the kind of uh, CFT um, toolkit that they, they, that they use. Okay, so, so why this Tumonagalatin liquid uh, here is? So I just mentioned some examples. Uh, so, and they reconnect also with some examples we've seen um, in the previous uh, talks. So, one main motivation is to study, uh, well, XSZ spin chain. So I just review the usual case. You have the form, usual XSZ spin chain with some anisotropy delta. Now uh, you have some coupling uh, and some coupling J, and this is the usual um, SU2 case. And well, in a low energy description, you can model this, or effectively describe this Hamiltonian with the uh, tumulagalactic liquid with well, V and K picked in this particular way, obtained by the beta ensembles. Uh, and well, since delta and J are constant, this V and K are constant. So that's a usual case. Uh, now you can ask the question, what happens if you let the overall coupling strength J depend on position? So, so this is the, the question. Uh, so you make it inhomogeneous. It's not inhomogeneous in the same sense as we saw, or not necessarily the same as we saw in the previous, in previous talks, where the inhomogeneity was in, introduced by having a spectral parameter that was uh, allowed to, you know, to zero. Here is the coupling uh, um, that depend on position, and perhaps there is some correspondence between the two. If someone knows, you can please um, enlighten me. Or, um, however, so I'm interested in studying this model, for instance, but then in the effective sense. So you do the same steps you do when you obtain the effective description in the, in the case when, when j is constant, just yes, that, well, now we should assume that j as a function of lat, uh, lattice uh, site varies slowly, because if, you, if it varies very rapidly, you will have lots of unclapped terms and your, your, this effective description is, 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 is gone. So now if it varies uh, some smooth function, think of it as a mesoscopic scale. It's larger than lattice spacing, but clearly smaller than the macroscopic system size. Then, in this case, we find a propagation velocity, and one can show that propagation velocity will depend on um, the coupling, and the coupling, how they vary in position. While since delta is constant, k is constant. And if delta would also depend on position, you would have a k that also depends on position. So that's one example. Another example. So what happened with the, uh, the all the parameters? Uh, so suppose you have critical system, delta, between uh, minus one and one. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. I should assume between. Yeah. So what will happen? Will we get correlation length or not? Um, correlation length in. Uh, um, uh, well, the uh, uh, the uh, delta between uh, uh, minus one and one system is critical. Yes. Correlation length is equal to infinity. Yes. Okay, so what I mean, so if you uh, make it uh, varying from mm -hmm. side to side, you will get finite um, localization? Oh. So, 
I do not know the answer to that. Um, in the sense that so far all I've been able to study in this framework is, is basically one point functions. So if you would like to study, say, uh, two point functions to see how the algebra, if you, what kind of decay you have with space, then, then well, you, you would need to do something more complicated than I'm trying to do. Uh, it's something I'm very interested in doing. But, but so far, the reason why I'm, I'm will do this PD approach is because uh, I didn't find any other way of proceeding. Um, but um, possibly, but I do not know the, the answer. But I'm interested to know. Yeah. Um, another example is the Lieblinger model. You can write it again. It's a, I just try to be brief. You, you again, you have this um, theory of uh, bosons in one D. Uh, where well you have some interaction uh, uh, G, and uh, I wrote it in a second quantized form. And again, the statement is that well, in a certain uh, in a low energy regime, you can replace this Hamiltonian, or you can you can approximate it with a homogeneous monoclonal liquid. Again, with V given by some uh, uh, V and K given by the parameters in, in, in the model. And here, you don't have a nice explicit formulas for, for a Lutting parameter, but, but you have uh, asymptotic expressions in certain regimes. But in general, the, the, the statement is, is true, that you can write it uh, however exactly what K should be, you, you would have to work a bit harder. Okay, uh, then now, the Liebinger model can be used to model or to describe um, cold atoms in a trap. So you take the same model as before, but now you add a trap, V of X, and some chemical potential. And now, that V of X will break translation invariance, and this will come in to how this um, uh, parameters and propagation velocity are defined, in a sense that these will depend on the overall uh, density. And the density follows the shape of the trap in a Thomas Fermi regime, and so the propagation velocity and locking parameter will also follow. The same shape. So now both are position dependent. So that's another application. That's um, uh, quite realistic to, to, to study in an experiment. It's something that's been studied in, for instance, the, the group of uh, uh, Professor Schmiermeyer in, in Vienna. They, they can make this uh, trap and change the, the trap to different uh, shapes. In, in principle, they want to get rid of the trap, in a sense. But in this case, you can usually you would have to have a harmonic trap, but in principle, you can do whatever trap. So that's one application. So now then try to explain why, why this PDE. So if you recall that the Hamiltonian had this form, we have this position dependent coefficients in front of the, 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 the two terms in the Hamiltonian and they're periodic. So in a sense, optimally you would like to diagonalize this Hamiltonian. And by diagonalizing is finding this a and A bar that are decoupled such that you can uh, do your computations like, uh, as a product of uh, many uncoupled harmonic oscillators. However, so in the case when K is constant, you can do a Bogleman transformation and find this. However, when, when K is not constant, it's not that simple. The more reason to see it is that, well, you can write down the transformation, but the fields in your theory, uh, phi and um, and this conjugate by it will, will no longer satisfy the usual commutation relations. So you will have extra terms there. So, so they're no longer, well, I don't know what they are, but it's no longer the same bosonic theory. So you have to do something else. Um, another way is perhaps, <coughs> this one can, can kind of guess, is that, well, when we wrote this A and A and bar, uh, we um, fully transformed in, using plane waves. Because translation of variance makes, I mean, plane waves is a good assumption. However, if you break translation of variance, then perhaps plane waves is not the best choice. It isn't. Uh, but you can, uh, you, you can formulate the Stumbleville problem, find the eigenfunctions of that Stumbleville problem, and expand in those, and then you can do this uh, setup. So, uh, so, for instance, if you have a parabolic trap for optical atoms, it's known that you, use, you will have Legendre polynomials. So, you expand the Legendre polynomials, you can do computations as usual. However, so that's been studied in equilibrium settings and uh, by myself and um, uh, uh, Marek Lusa and Spiros Ogeris in a non equilibrium setting, trying to compute Green's functions and so on, how system evolves following a, basically a quantum quench. However, I mean, if you don't know, if you have some general trap or some general deformation, 
v uh, and k of x, then I mean you wouldn't know exactly what SL uh, Sturm Lewis problem. There's something in generality exists. Sturm Lewis problem. We'll have eigenfunctions, etc. But if you don't know what they are, then it's hard to use them to get explicit uh, expressions. So in that way, it's not a, a practical approach. So for this reason, instead I, I, I turn to this uh, PD approach. Um, okay. So instead of trying to diagonalize the, the Hamiltonian, what I do is that, well, you can introduce this kind of uh, new right-to-left moving densities, rho tilde, you, you pick this linear combination of your original fields, pi and phi, then you can write the Hamiltonian in this way. Okay. Okay. This would be one step in the way of deriving the, the, the PDE. Um, so one thing you can check is what kind of uh, commutation I should satisfy. So, so if you look at uh, how, so plus is basically a right mover, and minus is basically a left mover. However, the, the complication here is that how you divide into right and left movers depend on k. And since k depends on position, how you divide into right and left movers varies in position, or varies in space, so your division into right and left movers is, is, is not the same. So that kind of highlights this. So, so you will usually have the, or will lead to this. So you have basically the, the same commutation relations within the same species, right or left mover. However, between them you have now some coupling that depends on this lambda of x, which, is, which you, you can show is given by a derivative of the logarithm of square root of k of x. So again, if k is constant, this is gone, the coupling is gone. But now you basically have two coupled algebras through this, uh, this uh, lambda. Okay, so that's the result you can show. Uh, the next step is to, well, so you can introduce, so let's try to derive the equation of motion. So use Heisenberg equation, uh, you can introduce the current uh, corresponding to uh, rho plus minus, and just multiplying by some factors, and then you show that, well, they will satisfy two coupled continuity equations. So you will have the, the usual continuity equation, I mean, this is on the left-hand side, dt rho plus, uh, dx j plus, however, on the right-hand side, it will depend on the density rho minus and, and, and vice versa. And now, so here I introduce this delta, it is multiplied by u of x, and now if you express this entirely in terms of j tilde, you, you obtain this uh, inhomogeneous uh, uh, direct volume of the gender equations. So if you can solve that, you can solve the, the dynamics, uh, at least in terms of these operators j tilde plus and minus, and whatever you can express with j tilde plus and minus, then you can study those, uh, their time evolution. So now that is the result. Uh, and what we've seen is basically that this k of x opened up a local gap, or an effective gap. Um, OK, so now if you can solve that, uh, then you can understand the, the dynamics. So just. Two, two comments. One is that, well, this, this uh, PDs I wrote down, it, it kind of corresponds that you have two conserved quantities in this model, or two conserved currents, uh, and a vector current and an axial current. So uh, with the corresponding density is rho and j, and rho 5 and j5. And you can show that, well, the dense, for instance, I induce because we'll study the current later. So rho, you can com get a, some combination of rho tilde plus and rho tilde minus, so you get the total density. And the same for the current. So if you can, if you know what uh, how they evolve in time, then you can study the total evolution of density or total evolution of, of current in the system. Another uh, another remark is that, well, we can introduce we can we can still Fourier transform and it, it define this a and a and bar corresponding to uh, the right movers and the left movers. And what you then find is that, well, you again have Within the same species, they satisfy the usual U1 current algebras, but because of this coupling in between the algebras, now you have some non-zero term on the right-hand right side. So uh, in a sense, you have a generalization of the usual U1 current algebras, where you have this coupling, so you have, uh, in a sense, a coupled U1 current algebra, or double current, current algebra, which I, I have not seen before. Um, I mean, if someone has seen, you can please uh, enlighten me. Uh, however, in a sense, now you introduce some kind of um, coupling between the modes. So you have no longer uncoupled harmonic oscillators, but they are coupled. But in a way that we can still 
do some exact or obtain some exact uh, results. And again, if, if k is constant, uh, lambda n is zero, and so the error was decoupled. So you recover the usual case. So what's the vacuum here? Ah, it's a good question. Um, so that's um, in a sense to answer that question, it would be more convenient to to kind of go to the framework when you use not plane waves, but you expand in the general eigenfunctions that you have when you solve the Sturm-Liouville problem. And in that formulation, everything is uh, it's easier to answer. Here, uh, I don't have a good answer, or that's something I have not explored yet. So rather, so far I, I use it to, to understand. Yes? How, how do you represent these uh, commutation relations? Uh, so, what I actually don't use those commutation relations in the computation, all I do is I solve the PD. Oh, there's a reason why I only I mean, do that. Uh, I, I, I would like to understand this algebra better and see, I mean, in what sense, uh, if this is trivial or non-trivial, this, this, this kind of uh, coupling between them and, and, and to, to, to understand the, the algebraic framework. But that, that's uh, a future direction that I, I, I would like to understand. But if you have any ideas on this, I'm very happy to, uh, to you know. Um, so, so I did not proceed in this direction. This is also one reason why I do the, the PD approach. Uh, so, now solving the, these equations. So, if you recall, you had this uh, currents, J plus and J minus, we tilde them, and they satisfy this uh, uh, coupled um, equations, um, coupled via this um, uh, gap, or effective gap. One thing you can do, you can reshuffle the terms a bit, so you can write it as dx uh, acting on the, the vector j plus j minus, and then you have some matrix with time derivative, uh, can you say vector equal to zero. So, so that uh, will be useful in the sense that it will reconnect to um, previous works uh, trying to solve similar equations. So, as I said, like Fourier transforming is not a good approach, at least not in space. But what you can do, you can Fourier transform in time. Uh, the translation is still uh, preserved. So Fourier transform in time, this is denoted by this hat. Then you have dx acting on uh, the, now this uh, currents depending on uh, frequency. You have some matrix P. And uh, I, I suppose transform from t equals zero to infinity. So I'm, I'm envisioning having a situation where you have some initial conditions. So you have some, some stationarity at time equals zero or equilibrium, and then you make a change. And then you, you, you take that uh, values at t equals zero as, 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 as input. So that's, that's what you have on the right hand side. So it's just a weird transform. Now this matrix P has the following shape. Uh, it has, well, omega divided by V of x, or the frequency. This is basically a free part, and then you have an interacting part. So you can see it as a parallel to um, a two-level system where, um, with, with uh, some interaction, and actually, in a sense, it's, uh, it's uh, well, non-remission, but it's, you can show it as PT symmetric. And the, the tricky part here is that it basically corresponds to uh, time-dependent Hamiltonian. So if x were t, then this is the and p, or you call it h, and there's a time-dependent Hamiltonian, and this is the, the, the corresponding equation you want to solve. Uh, problem here is that, as usual for time-dependent Hamiltonians, is that, well, since everything depends on position, these matrices at different positions do not commute with each other. So you need to introduce some spatial ordering. Same as you have to introduce time ordering for, for, for time-dependent Hamiltonians. Um, so, so that would be the, the main complication now to, to, to proceed. Um, but it's also natural here to say, think of using a kind of interaction picture where you, you, you have a, the free part and the interaction part. Okay, so now this goes back to work, I mean, it's older, but one important model saw started by Magnus in 54 was the case where you have some vector, time derivative, and you have, again, a matrix that depends on time uh, acting on the same, same vector. And now you would like to solve this equation. And in general, as you know, this, uh, you, you cannot simply exponentiate or integrate this. I mean, you, you have to introduce some, some more complicated thing, which is, uh, in Magnus' case, then what led to Magnus expansions. So, that's what I will do. So, 
I will not go through the details, but the statement is that you can construct, if you introduce this normal ordering, uh, I don't know, the, the ordering, spatial uh, ordering, uh, you can write down the Green's functions. So, uh, given some initial conditions, uh, t equals zero, you can construct uh, Green's functions g that gives you the, the value at any point x and t in, in the future, which is obtained as a, well, you, you, you have to undo the full transform in, 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 uh, in time, and then you have two parts, one for basically right movers and one for left movers, and you have some projection operators here. You, you, you have to introduce them in order to get something that's, that's causal, so it's propagating forward in time. If you did not have them, then you would have basically have forward and backward uh, trans um, propagation. So, so I would like to have something that's, well, evolving for positive time. And these individual parts can be obtained as, I mean, this is basically to, to account for uh, right movers pick up things from the left of them and, and no, right of, and, uh, you know, left of them and, 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 and vice versa. And then you have this path ordered uh, integral or path ordered exponential. And uh, well, so that's kind of a complicated beast. However, in the, in the case when k is constant, then, then these simplify a lot because you no longer have to account for the ordering and you get rather simple expressions. So you still have this, this delta, uh, this, this Kronecker, uh, uh, sorry, uh, you still have the set aside functions, but evolution is basically just in terms of this, this uh, function I introduced, tau xy, which is basically the time it takes to propagate from point y to x. So then, uh, your, 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 these exponentials are just replaced by this, this much more simpler um, exponentials. So the biggest problem now is how, how, how do you study these uh, path over exponentials? So, so what do they mean? I mean how, how, how do you plot them, say? How would you like to access the information? So uh, I know at least three possibilities. You can use a Dyson expansion, a Magnus expansion, or you can also write this uh, so quite some interesting result we use. Uh, you can write as a product of exponentials of the generators of the algebra. So mm -hmm. this matrix P lived in SL2, and so in general, it will still, the exponential will still remain in SL2, and you can write it in terms of these generators of the SL2. So the first thing I will just mention is that, okay, uh, well, you can generate the algebra by sigma three, sigma one, and sigma two, so you can also pick this linear combination, and if you do that, then you can uh, write, uh, say, for the solution for x large and y, you can write that uh, the path of exponential as a, as a product of exponentials of um, each generator separately with some coefficients, and the coefficients you can show satisfy some coupled, OD, uh, coupled ODs. And I mean, this is again a rather complicated thing, but one can show that this can be reduced to a Riccati equation. So you can solve it by quadrature, and then you can obtain, so say, uh, for one of them, and then you can obtain the others from the solution. But then you, you have to solve this Riccati equation, which I did not do. Instead, I will do the magnitude expansion. You also reorder to put uh, like E, H, F or the other way around, so that you more like a Gauss decomposition. Because hmm? here you put the sort of the Cartan part in front. You, maybe it's more natural to put it in the middle. Right? I don't know if the coefficients would look ah. like uh, so, so I actually, it might be a nicer way of writing it. I, I basically, stumbled across this, these papers by V and Norman, and they had this algebra as a special case. So I could reuse their formulas. So that I didn't spend time in moving things around, but, but uh, um, uh, so, so it was kind of nice to see that, well, I mean, it is a simple special case. Of course, you can use it for more complicated algebras. There are some conditions, in particular for, for how valid this representation of the solution uh, will be and how globally valid it will be. So, so that, that relates to the properties of your Lie algebra. Um, but the, this, this one special case was uh, SL2. Well, why don't you just solve everything numerically? Ah, well, so the, the key here was that I wanted to obtain analytical solutions for it. Uh, numerically, yes, okay, you can also try to do it numerically. Yes. But again, uh, in general, I, I'm interested in exact solutions, and I studied these uh, Lutting liquids a lot, or general um, CFTs, and here was something I, I, I knew people had tried to obtain analytical solutions, but not in principle. There are certain works, uh, there, there, there are a couple of works where 
you have a inhomogeneous fluxing parameter k of x, but they, they always kind of forced it to be constant in order to get some information. And so I wanted to not do that. And so in the previous work, one of them, uh, you had a specific shape of the Luttinger, uh, of, of, of uh, say, in the case of a harmonic trap uh, for this um, uh, trapped uh, ultra-cold atoms. And then you had a general polynomial, so we studied that uh, with polar variables. But then the question was, can you do it for general k of x? And I, this is what uh, that ended up with. Um. But the, the solution of this uh, system is another p exponential, yes? Hmm? Solution of the uh, system yes. of differential equation. You start it with two equations, ends it up with three. Ah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so that's that's not um, well in, in in this formulation. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But you can you, you can start reducing this to one again. So you, you you can write down a single equation for one of them. I don't know which one it is. It will solve and uh, recap the equation. If you find a solution there, you can obtain. Say, if it is H, you find then you can find G and F. From, from there. I mean, you simplify integrating the expression. Uh, so, 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 yes. That means that you could, could have done that with the original equation. Sorry? Oh, yes, yeah, so, but so this is not what I will work with. I will now do the analytical solution using minus expansion. Okay. So, what you can do, so we factor out the, the free part, so, you know, uh, uh, interaction picture, and then you have. Um, uh, you, you can write it, or this goes back to the work by Magnus, you can write this path ordered uh, exponential as an exponential of some series, or of some sum, where these um, uh, elements in the sum uh, are obtained uh, recursively. So, for instance, the, you take the Gohan literature and, and you find uh, the expressions for them uh, in the details, and you find that the first order term is, is basically um, the same as forgetting the the, um, the path ordering, and then you have a second order term. So a big Campbell house of basic, but in, in, a, in a continuous setting. So you will have many, many terms, and now so you will have an expansion in some parameter when you have then an infinite series um, where you can obtain each term in, in, in the series. But they have some interesting properties, and that is, for instance, all of the higher order terms, when omega goes to zero, uh, they go to zero. Because, for instance, here you have a sine to omega. This one will also have similar sine to omega times something. And so when omega is zero, everything is, these are all gone. And what you're left with is this. So you can use this, for instance, to study the solution close to stationarity. Uh, which is something I, I do. So, so in principle, I would like to understand or obtain something for the late time asymptot. So it's... Uh, yeah, you still have some time. Um, so, in principle, you can use these formulas now to study the, the late time asymptotics. So, when only is zero, the only thing that's left is uh, the first term. And since uh, it only depends on p when omega is zero, then these, these matrices now commute with each other. And so, all you're left with is the, the first order term, and you can integrate this, and you find the following expression. So that's basically what's left of the dynamics at t to infinity, more or less. Uh, so we can even prove that, well, I know what the Green's function are, it is the, the, the general one, and one can then show that for large t, that you can replace the Green's function by this matrix uh, t, depending on x and y, the, 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 the two endpoints, basically, times the, the Green's function when k was constant. And this, when k is constant, is a rather simple thing because the, the equation decouple is basically solving a wave equation. And so now you can you have fully explicit solutions. So for large times, this is fully explicit. And in, for instance, then for uh, for the current, which is you obtain as a sum of the two uh, two parts j plus and j minus, then you can write down an explicit expression that is valid up to uh, corrections in uh, in time where you, 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 you basically have, uh, now you, your Green's functions is, is dependent on, on the propagation time to go from point, uh, this is time going from point a, uh, y to x, and so everything is replaced by these delta functions, and now this you can plot. So that gives a uh, uh, large time uh, ex um, expression for, for, for the current. Um, 
Another thing you can compute is imagine you take a subsystem uh, and you, 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 you have no initial current within this uh, subsystem and you have instead currents incident at point y and x then uh, you can, in the same way as you obtain the Green's functions, you can obtain a transfer matrix between this point y and x and it's given in, again by the path already exponential and when omega is uh, zero, this is, uh, simplifies and you obtain the same matrix uh, T uh, as, as, as on the previous uh, slide. So this is again fully explicit and what's important is that it only depends on the endpoints y and x. So if, if k, this is some smooth function in space, uh, if the value at uh, point y and, and x are the same, then this is just the identity matrix. And if not, then you have some scattering um, in the model. So you can also use this to compute the corresponding uh, scattering matrix. So, so, so you reshuffle the, the, the components of, or the elements of the, the transfer matrix, and you show then that, well, you can compute the transmission amplitude and the reflection amplitude. And again, for omega zero, they simplify, uh, and you get this uh, simple expressions. And similar expressions were obtained before by, for instance, Bacchus and Brunner, where you had a single step-like change in, in K. So this, this generalizes that result to any shape of the Lattinger parameter. And uh, it also gives a simple expression of like, why, why things only depend on, on, on the um, a simple explanation of why things only depend on the endpoints. So in the original world of the and officials, they, they again, they had like uh, two step-like changes in Lattinger. And they, they computed for that, and then they have an argument that it should not depend on the value between the two steps. Uh, however, now that the argument is, is simply, well, what I did on the previous uh, slide, I, I have, I'm integrating a uh, total derivative. So this uh, lambda is a derivative of uh, log square root of k, so it's just uh, basic analysis telling you that, well, it only depends on the endpoints of this uh, integral. Um, okay, and one thing you can also show is that, well, since I know <coughs> how the transfer matrix for uh, j tilde plus and j tilde minus, you can also write them down for rho and j, and you can write down the corresponding transfer matrix, so <coughs> and you show then that, well, if you're given the values at some point y of these uh, um, expectation values, then you can obtain any point x and they're related by the transfer matrix. So in particular, the current j is universal and this combination of v, k, and rho is uh, also universal because they are related them by the identity matrix. So uh, do I have like two minutes to? Yes, I have two minutes. Um, so one application you can use this for. So you know you can study time evolution in, in this kind of inhomogeneous systems. Uh, one example we consider is like quantum crunch, where you start with some, you have some system with a smooth chemical potential profile. Uh, you're trying to kind of replicate this situation of a quantum wire connecting two reservoirs with some chemical potential mu L and mu R to the left and right. Um, and then for simplicity, let also K and V be constant to the left and right. Then uh, I showed in a previous slide that, well, the V over K multiplied by rho is universal, uh, so you can use that to compute what the initial value of the density is, and you can also then show if you're in equilibrium, the current is zero, so now you have kind of the input for the, the evolution of the current. So if you plug this into the expression for, uh, for the current, you can compute uh, the value when uh, the current goes to infinity, uh, when the time goes to infinity, and you show that it's only dependent on the, the difference between the values of mu at the endpoints, but renormalized by the, the values of the Lattinger parameters at the endpoints. But it doesn't depend on what's in the middle, it all depends on the side. So that's a known result, um, which now is recovered as time goes to infinity, while in principle, the formulas I give, you can use it to study also things for finite time. So that brings us to the summary. Um, so what I studied is, well, I'm interested in studying two molecular liquids and um, uh, show that the dynamics is described by this uh, 
uh, Dirac problem with the gem equations, which was not observed before. Then I tried to solve this in general and, in and use it to obtain results for late time and uh, stationarity. And the number of applications. And one thing I want to stress is that, well, this approach you can use for more complicated systems. So, so more complicated algebras, or in principle, whatever these kind of equations appear, you, 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 you can do this uh, approach, which is applicable to the other um, instances where, for instance, um, scattering on, on an interface between a superconductor and normal, um, normal metal, and so on. And uh, what I'm interested to do is in the future is, for instance, compute correlation functions, which is much more difficult, or generalize to, or generalize to, to, to heat transport, because what I studied so far is basically uh, charge transport and particle currents and so on. So with that, I want to thank you for your attention. So if you have delta constant, uh, you can this as a kind of mass term, you, you couple two chiralities of uh, the two fields of two different chiralities, so just, uh, just to understand what, what is the delta term. Uh, ah, the, the delta term is, is the coupling between Yeah, the two so it, 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 it gives a kind of a mass of uh, to, to, to the field, so uh, not, you cannot interpret it as a, a mass term. Well, uh, no, it's uh, I mean, it, it has this interpretation from, from just by comparison with uh, Bouglou de Gen, that is referred to as a gap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there is, you can try to reformulate uh, the model as, as it appears as a mass term also, but, but uh, in a sense it is some kind of mass, but it's, it's not the usual mass that you have in the, in the um, say, uh, Lagrangian formalism. You write the mass times uh, some um, phi squared or something like that. But if effectively you open up a gap, but... Um, which is something people are interested in, in, in doing, but usually when you do that, you, you, you spoil some kind of, uh, well, you, 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 your approach to do exact uh, computations. So, so that's, I try to open up a gap, but not spoil, I mean, I, I have an expansion, right? So it's not fully explicit, but it's uh, more explicit than. <clears throat> Any more questions? Well, let's thank the speaker again.